Born in 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire, Herman Webster Mudgett, or as he is better known today, H. H. Holmes, would grow up to be one of America's first and most brutal serial killers. Growing up, Holmes was a bright child, notoriously intelligent and interested in medicine. However, his interest was not in the healing aspects of the craft, but more so in the macabre nature of the medicinal arts. He was fascinated by skeletons and death, allegedly performing surgery on animals in his youth. A year after graduating high school, he married his first wife, Clara Levering, in 1878 in New Hampshire. A bigamist, he would go on to have three wives simultaneously up until his death. Soon after, he began attending the University of Michigan Medical School, where his life of crime began. While studying at the school, he would take out fake life insurance policies and claim them using stolen cadavers from the university. These policies would be worth between ten to 12000 then, or two hundred to 250000 today. In order to make the claim seem believable, he would disfigure the cadavers' faces with acid and burn their bodies beyond recognition. This was the first hint at his twisted ways. He would perform this type of scam throughout his life, exemplifying the aspect of strain theory known as innovation, in which individuals accept their culture's goals but reject the institutionalized means of acquiring them. After passing his medical exams, he moved to Chicago in 1886 and got a job at a drugstore. By this time, having already married his second wife, Myrta Belknap, in Minnesota, while still married to Clara, his first wife. He then acquired an empty plot of land across from the store where he would build his evil masterpiece, the Murder Castle. Construction began in 1887 for a mixed-use building with shops on the first floor, apartments on the second, and later a hotel on the third. However, Holmes' true plans were far more sinister. Through shady business tactics and by continuously hiring and firing construction crews, Holmes was able to conceal what was really going on. Of the over 100 rooms on the second and third floors, many were windowless, soundproofed with a special and lined with gas lines Holmes could use to asphyxiate his guests whenever he desired. Throughout the building were trap doors, peepholes, dead-end stairways, and chutes that led to the basement. In the basement was Holmes' lab, which featured a dissecting table, a stretching rack, and a crematory. During this time was when Holmes committed many of his supposed 27 murders. While only 9 can be plausibly confirmed, some sources put his body count at over 200, although that figure is generally considered a myth. While his murder spree might have began before he left the Northeast, Holmes' first victims in Chicago were his mistress Julia Smith and her daughter Pearl. Just like every other employee of the castle, Julia was required to take out a life insurance policy and name Holmes as a beneficiary. Coincidentally, after Christmas 1891, neither Julia nor her daughter were ever seen again. His next confirmed victim was Emmeline Sagrand, another employee of the castle. She was killed sometime in December of 1892. After her, he plotted the death of Minnie Williams, a one-time actress looking for a job in 1893. After Holmes convinced her to transfer over the deeds to her property in Texas to him, Minnie, as well as her sister Nanny, were never seen alive after July 5th, 1893. This is where the number of Holmes victims fluctuates depending on the source. During the summer and fall of 1893, Chicago held the World's Columbian Exchange during which Holmes conveniently had a place for weary travelers to rest their heads. Nameless, faceless, the sea of strangers that flooded Chicago were prime targets for Holmes. In fact, mass urbanization is one contributing factor towards the emergence of the modern serial killer. The increased anonymity that came with the rise of cities in the late 1800s made the era perfect for the creation of America's first serial killer. Holmes could have murdered dozens of individuals during this time, though we may never know for sure. After the fair came to an end, he traveled around the United States with his accomplice, Benjamin Peitzel. He became Holmes' right-hand man, helping him commit numerous schemes. One attorney even referred to Peitzel as Holmes' tool, his creature. Around this time, Holmes would have married his third wife, Georgiana Yoke, in 1894 in Colorado. Holmes and Peitzel began to steal horses and mortgaged goods in Texas and sell them in St. Louis for a fortune. However, Holmes was subsequently arrested for this. Lucky for him, there was no suspicion he might be one of the most prolific murderers of the time. While in jail, he struck a deal with his cellmate Marion Hedgepeth, a notorious train robber serving a 25-year sentence in prison. This deal stated that Holmes would fake his own death, claim his life insurance policy, and pay Hedgepeth $500 in exchange for the name of a lawyer that would help him in times of trouble. Though, once he was released on bail, the plan failed with the insurance company in Philadelphia failing to pay up. This twist of fate marks the beginning of the end for Holmes and his reign of terror. 
Because his initial plan to fake his own death failed, Holmes suggested Pitezel fake his own death so the two could collect Pitezel's life insurance policy. However, instead of helping him fake his death, Holmes actually killed Pitezel and collected the money for himself. In a move of pure evil, he then manipulated Pitezel's unsuspecting wife into giving him custody of three of her five children, Alice, Nellie, and Howard. While in Toronto, Holmes asphyxiated the two girls with gas in a locked trunk, and while in Indianapolis, he drugged the boy before chopping up and burning his body. After not receiving his payout from the original plan, Hedgepeth tips the police off to Holmes' insurance schemes. They eventually caught him in Boston with the help of the Pinkerton detectives. Holmes seemed poised to leave the country by this point, making police suspicious. Chicago police searched the murder castle, finding bodies dismembered beyond recognition. The investigation spanned across Chicago, Indianapolis, Toronto, and Philadelphia, connecting Holmes to the murder of Benjamin and his children, and leading to Holmes' arrest. While in custody, he confessed to 27 murders, although some of the victims he named were in fact alive at the time of his arrest. His multiple confessions were sporadic, confusing, and mostly useless in the investigation of his crimes. Up until his death, he remained calm, not letting any emotion show on his face. After his last meal, he was hanged at Moyon Seng Prison in Pennsylvania on May 7, 1896. In a cruelly just fashion, his neck did not snap upon impact. He was strangled to death after suffocating for over 15 minutes. Strangely enough, Holmes asked for his coffin to be contained in cement and buried 10 feet deep for fear of grave robbers using his body for dissection. He is buried under an unmarked patch of grass in Holy Cross Cemetery in Yeadon, Pennsylvania. All told, America's first and most prolific serial killer has become the stuff of legend. A building designed for death sounds like it was ripped straight from the screenplay of a horror movie. His murders sound too brutal to be real. His story sounds like the stuff of urban legends. Holmes is now as much of an American tall tale as he is an historical figure. Like any good tall tale, though, his story is based in reality. And whether he actually said it or not, this excerpt from his confession sums him up perfectly. I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world, and he has been with me ever since. <laughs>